It's been organised by uh, Nikolai, who is standing modestly over there in the corner. The programme for the foundations of um, constitutional law, of government and constitutional law. Now hold on, let me get this right. <laughs> the programme for the foundations of law and constitutional government exists to encourage discussion and debate about constitutions and constitutionalism. So we're particularly pleased to be able to host this event. Though we do encourage discussion of um, constitutional law and constitutionalism, we don't, it seems, encourage the consumption of coffee. So I noticed that you're going to have to conduct this session in a decaffeinated state. Um, I, I came ready armed. I'm, I'm an old hand. Um, but there will be coffee at the end of this session. Nikolai was very concerned indeed that I tell you about where, tell you where the toilets were. Uh, I'm not sure why, but he was very concerned. The toilets are downstairs, so um, you just need to go down in the direct underneath here. Don't 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 go anywhere else. Um, in this first panel, we have um, Adam Chanukta. Oh, almost good. <laughs> Close. Uh, and um, Marcin Marchez, Marchez. Yeah, Marchez. And um, each will be speaking for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then I hope. No, a bit less. Or less, less, less works well too. And then we will have um, comments and questions from the floor. Um, and I'll pass over the first to Professor Charnutta. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my privilege to be here. So thanks to the organizers. <coughs> and I just one suggestion. I'm on the jet lag. I'm coming from Sydney, so take it into account when I will speak and lose my argumentation. And uh, it's an unusual day, actually, because this, uh, today is a day of Europe, as you guys know, and we are, talking, we are discussing the constitutional crisis in, in Poland. Well, uh, I prepared some paper here, but uh, what I want to talk about basically about three points. The first is uh, this crisis around the Constitutional Tribunal, the second about the post-communist <laughs> legal culture, and the third one about the legal or political versus legal constitutionalism. So the first one, Constitutional uh, Tribunal, is probably within my colleagues or even their close friends, such as Wojciech Sadurski or Martin Kiger, I'm a black sheep. Why I'm black sheep? Because my opinion and my arguments are totally against their arguments and their opinion about what is happening and, and what's happened in, in Poland since the last election. But it does not mean at the same time that I am simply an admirer of all the policies or the changes introduced by the new government. Actually, my position is that I criticize the government for not being radical enough. Right? So it seems to me that the changes introduced by the by the peace, it means the <coughs> law and mm, justice party, are not radical enough. They could be, they could change something radically, but they, they, they haven't done it yet. So in the present crucial crisis, as I mentioned, this position is, is the, that grammar of law, right? It means it's been not changed. That the government has uh, changed aesthetically, changed rhetoric, basically. But uh, outside this rhetoric, nothing much is been changed institutionally. And uh, therefore, we could say that the self-defense of the institutions, as was mentioned here, is only a spectacle. Is that that's a spe spectacle which which is visible, especially in the unprecedented mobilization and unification of the legal profession. That's something really unique in the world scale. The majority of lawyers, plus liberal political elites, claim that the constitutional tribunals have been captured or hijacked. In principle, I can agree with such a claim. Indeed, the uh, present ruling party, creatively interpreting law and sometimes bending it, introduced to the tribunal judges who presented a legal worldview close to that of the ruling party. In short, this legal world view is based on the principle of supremacy of the parliament in relation to the constitutional review and acceptance of a rule of judicial restrain, not judicial activism, which was earlier the norm. Such position, what is called political constitutionalism, is in opposition, in contradiction to the legal constitutionalism. It's been described, this situation, or this paradigm, basically, by, by Paul Blocher in his, in his book, when he analyzed the, the crisis of constitutionalism, or the social democracy in the Central Eastern Europe, but without Poland, because he wrote, he did his research and published this book before the crisis in, in Poland. So that what we've got here is that, <coughs> that uh, 
What interests, are, what interests me in the situation are the social and political condition for the takeover of the tribunal. I do not share the thesis formulated by the liberal circles that the ruling party use coercion in relation to, this, to the institution. In the present political discourse in Poland, the coercion thesis provides legitimacy and justifies the self-defense of, of the institution. If we put such an argument in a democratic context, it would mean that any outcome of each democratic change is institutional coercion. A different questions remain whether the ruling party, party's proposition are new and valuable. I would like to bring your attention to the fact that the present constitutional changes were prepared by the former constitutional tribunal itself. Using a metaphor, the situation remains as if a driver parks a car in a suburb with a high level of crime, leaving the keys inside, and the car is open, and later the driver expressed surprise that the car has been stolen. So I identify following condition to take over of a constitutional tribunal. First, lack of transparency in appointment of judges. Second, fetishizing of the independence of judiciary, which means there is no correlation between the understanding of the independence of judiciary in the Republic of Poland and the accountability of the judiciary in the same republic. Then, cynical attitudes of the political elites, doesn't matter from which side of the political spectrum. Low level of citizens' involvement in constitutional matters, and I think that partly this low involvement is a conscious policy of, conducted by the political elites of demobilizing citizens and making the constitution only constitutional <coughs> matter for lawyers, or even worse, for the constitutional lawyers. And a low level of the persuasiveness of the constitutional tribunal judgments. And it's surprisingly, it seems to me, nothing changed. That the, that the judgments were, after the takeover of the tribunal, that the judgments are written in the very hermetic <coughs> language, formal language. They are written by the judges to their colleagues, not even to the another judges, but the judges on the high level only. And so if we take into account there is no debate, no interaction, no dialogue with uh, citizens even, no, not citizens, and no dialogue in relation to the meaning of the Constitution. So when we consider all these conditions created by the Constitutional Tribunal, it is not surprising that mo almost nobody except lawyers defend the Tribunal. The question we must ask is how to explain such a high position, high prestige of the Constitutional Tribunal within the legal profession, but not so much within the population. The answer to this question we can find by looking more closely at the type of legal culture which exists in the Poland after 1989. And what I want to use now is uh, basically based on the article published by, by Alan Uzelas, the creation scholar, who <coughs> wrote an, it seems to be fun, <laughs> interesting article, trying to describe the legal tradition or the law in action after 1989 in all of those can Central Eastern post-communist European countries. So what the Uzelas did, he, made this, he claimed that since the 60s, within the comparative lawyers, there was an identification of the few different traditions, the common law tradition, civil law tradition, and the communist or socialist tradition. But what, is this, what was this socialist tradition according to the, to the comparative lawyers? Well, it was composed on the three elements. The first, recognition of instrumental role of law in relation to politics. Then the second, stressing real equality, not only formal legal equality. And the third, direct reference to Marxist ideology in the process of application of law. And now what Uzelat's claim is that if we remove the last one, which means that direct reference to the Marxist ideology, what remains is a tradition in a, understood as a law in action which means is an instrumental treatment of law and, uh, and formalism, right? So this <coughs> characteristic has been described by the, as I mentioned, by comparative lawyers. 
And the questions remain, can we identify some post-socialist tradition, basically, or post-socialist legal culture in the, in the region? It looks like that after the breakthrough, in uh, political breakthrough in 1989, rather rapidly voices which stress the existence of the socialist law tradition disappear. Now, 28 years later, maybe is a uh, worthwhile to simply brush this area and look closely that during the time of communism, some <coughs> new legal tradition or some elements of the new legal tradition really was <coughs> has been created. created. The post-communist post -communist legal tradition still exists and is doing, it seems to me, rather well. The present legal culture in Central Eastern Europe can be described as a continuation of the socialist law, legal, legal tradition. So in other words, when is what we could say that this reference to the Marxist ideology or the Marxist, uh, yeah, Marxist uh, philosophy was only the tip of the iceberg. That what remained below the, the water level, that's constitute really this proper post-socialist or post-communist post <coughs> legal tradition in Central Eastern Europe. And uh, <coughs> what is there is uh, that, is, uh, that in this post-communist legal tradition is a declared legalism understood as sticking to the legal text and at the same time, willingness to depart from the text if political risk of a decision is too high. The effect is undermining the trust to legalism, which means paradoxically, the legal tradition is working against the rule of law, despite the sort of the <coughs> uh, word service, mouth service, that is a that the law, legal, legal profession is actively involved in the, in the process of building rule of law and the legal culture based on the observance of human rights. Then the second feature is an is a unwillingness of lawyers to take a final decision. Submission of law to politics and the lack of political stability manifesting in circulation of elites create a situation where, since today's decision could be questioned, in the future, it is better not to take final decision. The tactic adopted by lawyers is to hide themselves behind the legal text, which supposedly do not provide any room for discretion. The best situation is if the legal text allows a judge to send the case to another institution. So we observe this sort of the legal pimple, right? One court, lower court, sent to the higher court, higher court, find something in the legal text and send back to the, to, the, to the lower court. Another tactic used in extension to the procedure and permanent searching for the new, evident, for new evidences. I mean, that's why it's one of the biggest uh, issue is the uh, is extension of the procedure, right? It means that it's this so-called <coughs> big burden uh, of cases waiting for, the, for hearing in, in, in the courts. An instrument of, in escaping from responsibility is also the hierarchy of courts. The magistrate court can send the case to the court of the second instance, as I mentioned, and uh, in reverse, the courts of second instance could send back to the magistrate. Another feature is a written, not oral procedure before the court and lack of procedural discipline in courts in the sense that the sessions are not planned properly. They are planned, not, unplanned, basically. The chaos is prevailing in the organization of the sessions. From my point of view, one of the most important features of the post-communist legal culture is the situation that fundamental decisions shaping the legal community were taken outside the court system. In post-communist legal culture, such decisions are reserved to the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Tribunal only, which means the top echelon. This, you could I use one's expression in the interview of the mandarins of law. Right? They decided basically about the shape of the profession in the, in the post-communist <coughs> Poland. And uh, Alain Uzelac convincingly argued that the post-communist legal culture is a very alive, which is surprising. Paradoxically, introduction to Central Eastern European countries of Western legal standards based on an ideal of rule of law 
strengthen post-communist legal culture. So it means that elements, ingredients taken from the West, standards there, they didn't change too much, but they reinforce the, the stability of this post-communist type of legal culture. The most important elements adopted after 1989 is the constitutional principle <coughs> of the independence of judiciary. Regional understanding of this principle is going far beyond institutional guarantee for independence of the judge in the adjudication process, but is interpreted as a principle, principle of organization of judiciary, its self-organization and autonomy of judiciary. It's a very good book published recently by, by uh, Kosash from Brno from the University of Brno, who analyzed uh, basically the problem of the independence of, of judiciary and the institutional guarantee of this independence. And uh, in the Polish case, within 28 years, no government was able to reform the judiciary. All attempts were blocked by the judiciary as attack on the principle of independence. Uzelas has shown that in practice the principle of independence in Central and Eastern Europe is reduced to monopoly of the judiciary as a professional group in the nomination, promotion, interference of the Council of Judiciary in legislative process and control of this group over legal education. Continuation of post-communist legal culture with regional interpretation of the principle of independence of judiciary is an example of acquiring by the institution not only shields, but a whole arsenal of weapons to defend itself. Only that this defense is a defense of the corporate interest. And the last part, last point, is this relation between the political and legal and, politi and, and the political constitutionalism. Can I have more time? Yeah, five minutes. A few minutes more? A few minutes more. <laughs> Thank you, gracias. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, mm, Poland celebrated this year the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Constitution. The 1997 Constitution belongs to the Polish Cultural Republic, Republican tradition, which focused on restraining political power, absolutum dominium, not on good governance. Yes. It is understandable if you take into account the past, right? the abuse of power, so that was necessary to set up institutions which will restrain the arbitrary use of power. But <coughs> as expected, this occasion was, with this 20th anniversary, was lost actually at the, to the serious discussion about the amendments on the change of the constitution or even common debate about the meaning of this constitution and the impact of this constitution on the <coughs> public life in the Republic of Poland. And uh, the constitution of 1997 plays an important role in life of the nation. It also became the foundation of the legal, consti legal constitutionalism, which for years has been perceived as something natural. Recently, legal constitutionalism stopped to be the only game in the city, and political constitutionalism slowly is recovering ground in public discourse. Which means what I mean by that, because we could bring plenty of different other categories, is that more and more the constitution is a, became a matter for the for the citizens, not only for lawyers. It is possible to look at the present social crisis in Poland as a struggle between the two different versions of constitutionalism, legal versus political. Legal constitutionalism receives legitimacy because of its role in institutionalization of elements of rule of law in Poland. Legal constitutionalism is based on principles of domination of law over politics, recognition of basic rights, equality before law, and stress on procedure, procedural justice. According to legal constitutionalism, it's possible to first set up apolitical rules of lawmaking. The second point, these rules should be created by lawyers. And uh, <coughs> I mentioned earlier that, uh, that Paul Blocker wrote this book, right, about the constitutionalists, and he rightly claimed, in my opinion, that the effect 
of legal constitutionalism, not only in Poland, but in basically all of those countries in Central Eastern Europe, was a very shallow <laughs> institutionalization of rule of law and the creation of a closed legal system which excludes citizens from constitutional matters. The place of excluded citizens was taken by lawyers. The system based on a unity of jurisdiction with sovereignty. Territory, territory and population does not provide identity and also does not stimulate the development of the regional integration. And it's precisely on the 9th of, of May, Day of Europe, I claim here, here that this uh, legal constitutionalist does not stimulate integration in such sense that is a rather connected with transfer of some competencies to, the, to Brussels, to the center, but not involving citizens as well, to the negotiation, it means sort of the building up the social ontology for the true, true <coughs> regional integration. Now the, and the, the state based on the legal constitutionalist, as I mentioned, easy transfer competencies. So is that what, what we observe now as a it's possible to interpret this crisis is that, that the political constitutionalist is slowly, slowly, not fully, but is taking place. It is, it is present at least more and more in the public discourse. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> is this good or bad? Well, it's, it's up to us to decide maybe in the discussion. Political constitutionalists stress the greater legitimacy of parliament rather than constitutional tribunals in lawmaking. Constitutional review is based on zero-sum game principle. Political constitutionalism <coughs> presents parliament as a place of dialogue. <coughs> and the element of political constitutionalism criticizes legal constitutionalism for monopolization of the constitution which belongs to the whole nation, and citizens should have the opportunity to interpret and use it in everyday activities. <coughs> Democratic political constitutionalist suggests that it is necessary to rethink the ontological base of the constitutionalism. The constitution is not an act but never ending dialogue <coughs> as postulate, which postulates greater participation of citizens. So what happened in Poland but also in other Central Eastern European countries is that legal constitutionalists alienated the constitution from citizens. Lawyers, and especially judges of constitutional court, presented the constitution as separated and transcendental to society, as meta-narrative. The constitution should, however, promote interactive between citizens. Political citizens' constitutionalism could be understood as social practices which, on the one hand, are defined, but also open to change. Sociologists tell us that separation of constitution from citizen in short terms could strengthen the constitutional system, this short-time effect, which appears as an improvement in legalism. But from the long-term point of view, long delay, it is <coughs> that's a that legal constitutionalists provide erosions of the legitimacy to the constitution. So I will <coughs> close, finish at this moment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to the symposium. Uh, before I start my presentation, let me make a short statement, which is important for me personally, but also many people in Poland and this statement concerns the status of my fellow participant to this to this uh, symposium, Professor Lech Morawski, who was invited as a judge of the Constitutional Tribunal of the Republic of Poland. Uh, Professor Morawski is a renowned legal philosopher and he is an author of books that I read and admire, but he is not a judge of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal in the light of the Constitutional Tribunal case law. Uh, because he was appointed to a place that was not actually vacant. So I would not like my present to be interpreted <coughs> as a support and acknowledgement of his appointment or a recognition of his, his authority in this position. Thank you. Uh, now to my presentation. So I, my plan for this presentation is twofold. First, I would like to 
analyze if Professor Barber's idea of self-defense in institutional order is a good tool to be used in order to interpret the Polish constitutional crisis. And I believe this tool is very useful, however, it requires some kind of enhancement, some kind of elaboration, and in the first part of this speech, I will try to show how this idea of institutional self-defense can be a bit more elaborated and how it can be enhanced, enhanced in order to be used to analyze the Polish constitutional crisis. And secondly, I would like to apply this enhanced tool and to show how it explains and, and illuminates what really happened in, in Poland during the last 18 months. So as you are aware, Professor Barber's idea is that not only private persons, but also institutions can use self-defense, can self-defend themselves uh, against the attacks from other institutions. And this, this, this concept of institutional self-defense it's especially good, I think, when applied to the clashes between two branches of the government, especially the most dangerous one and the least dangerous one, namely the legislature and, and judiciary. Uh, Professor Barbers makes a distinction between two types of this kind of tools. Active, which are called swords, and passive, which are called shields. And for example, as far as judiciary is concerned, an example of a, of a sword is, and I quote, a power to strike down executive or legislative actions that interfere with access to the courts, end of quote. And an example of a shield is uh, that the decisions of the courts are protected from the scrutiny of the legislature. Uh, I would like to take issue with one element of this uh, conceptualization of self-defense. I think it is over-inclusive because it uh, covers not only tools that are uh, regular and lawful, but also those that are extraordinary and sometimes, at least prima facie, unlawful. So there is a conflation here, I believe, between at least three types of actions, th three types of, of activities that uh, has even Latin names, so they are very old in our culture, namely the contra legem actions, those actions that are against the law, Secundum legem, legem actions, those that are within the law, and preta legem, that are outside the law, somehow in between the two. Uh, and I think this conflation of three types of actions that the institutions can use is visible when we apply the original idea of the self-defense that, 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 that originated in the criminal law. When, if you, if you think for a moment, in, crimi in the criminal law, there is no sense in perusing if lawful actions are performed in self-defense. There, there, there is no need for that. You can perform some action in self-defense self if you attack a robber that broke into your house at <coughs> 2 a.m., but you cannot self-defend against a policeman that has a valid search warrant. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So, so a self-defense makes sense only if it is used against contra legem actions or preter legem actions and not secundum legem, legem actions. So there's, there's, there's no possibility of defend yourself in the criminal law idea of the self-defense against the lawful actions. Uh, why is it so? Because the self-defense is a way of justifying your actions. If you kill someone in self-defense, it's still a killing. But you have a chance to justify that this prima facie unlawful action was justified because it was performed in self-defense. I'm afraid that in this original conceptualization of self-defense in institutions by Professor Barber, you cannot make a distinction between the two. So both the actions that are lawful, like deciding a con performing a constitutional review, and the actions that are a misuse of power, uh, can be treated in this original position as, as self-defense. I would like to propose a change that consists in, in, in the following, in the following uh, proposal. Let's say that we have two types of actions, the lawful, the regular actions by the institutions, and these are not actions performed in self-defense. I propose a, a term, a self, actions in self-assertion of the, of the authority's function, and those 
with regard to which we have some kind of doubts that are control legal or pretel legal, <coughs> but we can somehow justify them because of the state of necessity or any 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 other other factor. So if we make this distinction, I think so. And this is this is the the change or, or the modification to the original proposal by Professor Barber. I think. It, the, the, the tool of the institutional self-defense will work better, especially in the case of the Polish, of the Polish uh, crisis. And why to propose those, this, this distinction between self-assertion and self-defense, between the uh, lawful actions and unlawful actions in the context of self-defense? First of all, if we do this, we can, it is a possibility that the culpability of the of the parties can be somehow allocated. You cannot blame a constitutional court for legal actions. You cannot blame a parliament for enacting a statute. You can blame them for misusing their powers. Yeah? So, so, so we can say if an action is justified, we can assess if an action is justified or, or, or not. Secondly, within this criminal law, idea of self-defense, you can do some, something that is called ad hoc balancing of values. So you can say if there was a reason for using a contra legum or preta legum actions because of some greater value that was protected by this, by this action. For example, you can ask a question if a constitutional tribunal or court can, uh, can find a preta legum, so not previously existing tool, to protect its uh, independence. Yeah. So, so, so if, if the independence of the constitutional court justifies <coughs> using a tool that is not fully legal, yeah? the, this question makes sense within within this new within this enhanced model of, of self defense. And thirdly, you can use a long-standing criteria of self defense <coughs> elaborated within the criminal law to assess the institutional actions. Those criteria involve necessity, proportionality, immediacy and duty to retreat. And in discussing the elements of the Polish constitutional crisis, I will try to show you that the actions by the Polish constitutional court fulfilled those criteria. They were necessary, they were, they, they, they were proportionate, and, and, and so on. I cannot say so about the actions by the parliament. So, so, so that, that's another, that's another reason, reason for which I believe that this, this elaborated, more elaborated idea of self-defense uh, that takes uh, into account the experience of the criminal law uh, idea of self-defense is, is a better tool uh, here. So, let's try now to apply this a lot more elaborated idea of self-defense to the Polish constitutional crisis. As I said, Professor Barber's proposal to use the idea of self-defense in the context of institution is illuminating. Because in Poland, for sure, both parties, the legislature and the judiciary, uh, perceive the conflict as the clash between the, between the branches, and both parties felt that they were attacked by the other. Yeah? What is m interesting is that the first to claim that it was attacked was the parliament and the legislative branch. Uh, if you look into the just justification, substantiation to the legal acts enacted in, in, in November 2015, Mr. Piotrowicz MP, who, 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 who spoke for this proposal, said that, he, that he, he was convinced that the Constitutional Tribunal would block the necessary reforms the new government planned to carry out. So we have here some kind of a preemptive self-defense. So, so the, the MPs are afraid that the Constitutional Tribunal will block the reforms and therefore they, they come up with the new legislation that is going to make it impossible. Yeah, so, Preemptive self-defense, so, something like that. Further, uh, Marek Ast MP, during the proceedings before the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, said that uh, there, there was a state of necessity to introduce those changes to the Constitutional Tribunal regulation. And again, he justified that the state of necessity was the, 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 mm, that the parliament was afraid that the Constitutional Tribunal would block the reforms. So we have here a narrative that is close to self-defense. The legislature says, I'm afraid of being attacked, and therefore I'm proposing the new legislation. This legislation was later criticized by the Venice uh, Committee as paralyzing the Constitutional Tribunal and making it impossible for, for it to work. Uh, 
Later, in March 2016, the Marshal of the Polish Sejm, the lower chamber of the Polish Parliament, Marek Kuchinski, said that the rights, and I quote, the rights of the Parliament have been infringed. And the infringement was the verdict of the Constitutional Tribunal from the beginning of March that uh, struck down the, 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 this legislation that was to paralyze the, 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 the Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, this is for the legislature. They felt that they, that they were afraid of being somehow blocked or attacked by the Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, Professor Andrzej Zapliński, the head of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, in November 2016, so a year later, also evoked the state of necessity when he, when he decided to, 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 to indicate a five-person panel instead of a full panel to sit on the new legislation that was proposed by, by, by the Law and Justice Party. So again, a state of necessity. The independence of the court, its, its, its ability to act is, is in danger. So we can see that there is, there is an idea here of being attacked and the idea of the necessity to defend. So, so, so something that is close to, to, to self-defense. To self and now, I think we can, if we apply the original idea by Professor Barbers to, those, to, 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 to the clash, I think both what the parliament did and what the Constitutional Tribunal did was the actions in self-defense. Because if we don't have any <coughs> distinct, distinction between lawful actions and unlaw unlawful actions, if, in fact, every action of an institution that, is, uh, that aims at, at defending its position is self-defense, so both the parliament and the constitutional tribunal acted in self-defense. However, if we use this more elaborated version that borrows some criteria from the criminal law, the situation looks differently. Yeah. Because, first of all, we need to decide who was the aggressor. Yeah? And for me, it's quite clear that the legislature was the aggressor <coughs> here. That the legislature started the attack. And moreover, if you, if you look into an, a, a press article from Newsweek, the Polish edition of Newsweek, it turns out that the legislation enacted in November 2015 was planned 10 years earlier, during the previous time when the law and justice uh, government uh, was uh, just won, won, won the election. Can an action in self-defense be premeditated? Can an action in self-defense be planned 10 years earlier? I don't think so. I don't think so that this, this, this action can be a self-defense. Self so if, if anything, what legislature did was a preemptive strike. So there was a, they were afraid of being blocked, so they started their action. Uh, I don't believe in preemptive self-defense. I don't believe in a preemptive strike in self-defense. Yeah? It should be a reaction to the, to, to, to the attack. Then, I think there was no restraint and no proportionality in what the Polish parliament did. As you perhaps know, the legislation that was found by the Constitutional Tribunal unconstitutional was proposed within 12 months, six times. The same regulation was, has been proposed six times to paralyze the Constitutional Tribunal. It doesn't look like self-defense, again. It doesn't look like self-defense. There is no restraint, there is no retreat here. There is a still action and attack on the, on the Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, illicit motive, that's something that is not a part of self-defense and it was present here. From my perspective, Polish legislature acted and the MPs acted with an illicit motive of attacking judges, they produce a chilling effect on the judges, they, uh, uh, they accuse the judges of laziness, they wanted to change the seat of the Constitutional Tribunal uh, to make it more difficult for the judges to organize their lives. Uh, the Polish Ministry of Justice presented numbers proving that the, that the Polish Constitutional Tribunal is lazy. So, Again, an illicit motive is not a part of, uh, of, of acting in self-defense. And finally, the actions by the, the, actions by the, by the parliament were contra legum actions. The, 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 the new legislation concerning the Polish Constitutional Tribunal had no vacatio legis period in order to allow the Polish Constitutional Tribunal to assess it. Uh, again, that was a contra legum action, and I don't see, because of not fulfilling those criteria of self-defense, any chance of justifying them. Now, to the Polish Constitutional Court. 
As I said, if the, if the legislature was attacked, I believe that the Polish Constitutional Court had the right to defend itself. Uh, and of course, there is some kind of, 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 of uh, <coughs> controversy here. If the first decision of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal from the beginning of March uh, was fully lawful. The problem was, as you perhaps are aware, that the new legislation governing the, 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 the operation of the Constitutional Tribunal has no vacatio legis, so the Constitutional Tribunal had a catch-22 problem. Should it apply the new legislation to the proceedings in which the new legislation is assessed? Yeah? And the Polish Constitutional Tribunal decided that it's not a good solution. Why? Because if you act on a legislation that is later found to be unconstitutional, your action is unconstitutional. So this is the catch-22 idea. Professor Gisbert Studinski will, will, will say more about that. So the Constitutional Tribunal suspended the legislation, assessed it, found it unconstitutional, and, uh, I, and I would like to stress it because it is not fully uh, acknowledged by the critics of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal I, I hope you know that in our constitution, the Polish constitution, we have two regulations. The first one is Article 8.2, and the second one is Article 195. The first one says that the judges, everyone in fact, can apply the constitution directly to the case at hand. And the second says that the judges of the Constitutional Tribunal, while performing their duties, are subject only to the constitution. So, there's no sense in accusing them that they were not using the legislation, the statute, because they were applying the Constitution directly and they were subject to the Constitution only in this performance. So, you cannot say that this action is a contra legem action, it is an un unlawful action, because there is a clear basis in the Polish Constitution to do so. So, so it cannot be, it, 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 it doesn't need even ju just justification, because it is based on the Polish, on the Polish uh, Constitution. Uh, I also believe that the actions by the Polish Constitutional Court were proportionate. Uh, if you look into another decision, uh, mid-2016, there were doctrinal reasons for striking down the whole new legislation, and the Polish Constitutional Tribunal decided that only a part of it is unconstitutional. That was surprising. That was that, because the lawyers, constitutional lawyers in Poland believe that again, the constitutional tribunal will strike down the whole legislation. For me, that's an example of a restraint. That, that's, that's, that's some kind of a retreat, you can say. So we don't go, we, we don't, we don't go too far with, with our decisions. <coughs> we try to be, to be <coughs> proportional. So, to sum up, I believe that if we if we uh, elaborate a bit more on Professor Barber's uh, idea of institutional self-defense, and this elaboration means that we use a long-standing long criteria of self-defense in the criminal law, also in tort law, uh, like uh, immediacy, necessity, proportionality, duty to retreat, uh, and if we apply this, this enhanced idea of, of self-defense to the Polish constitutional crisis, the conclusions are as follows. First of all, it was the legislature that was the aggressor in this action. Its actions were premeditated, planned 10 years earlier. Uh, it was a preemptive strike, and th that was a preemptive strike against the lawful actions of the, of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, third, uh, the actions were not proportionate because they were, they were, they, they were repeated six times. Uh, so there was no restraint in their, their actions, and I believe they were no, no, also not necessary, but perhaps we can, we can discuss. On the other hand, the Constitutional Tribunal acted in self-defense. Uh, its actions were a response to an attack, they were proportionate, they were restrained, uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were performed in a kind of restraint, uh, and they were justified. So, to conclude, I believe once more that this idea of self-defense is a very good tool to analyze the situation in Poland and perhaps other factual situations, but it requires some kind of, of more elaboration. Thank you very much. Well, I'm pleased to say we now have a um, chance for um, some observations from the floor and questions. I just want to check with Nikolai, is, this, is the question session going to be broadcast via the internet as well? Yes. In which case you should be aware that your comments will be winging their way around the world over the internet. 
um, that device that's done so much to enrich our understanding of politics and kittens. Um, I'm going to be quite strict about the questions. Um, I'm going to um, take groups of three questions. Um, there are going to be a number of opportunities throughout the day to ask questions, so if you're not asked now, hopefully you'll have a chance um, later on. If you can keep your comments reasonably brief, that'd be appreciated. And also, if you could identify who you are before you ask your question, that would also be um, very helpful. So, I saw Richard first. And then, um, well, so, Richard Eakins, uh, University of Oxford. Uh, thank you both for a very stimulating um, uh, papers and presentations. Uh, can I ask a question for each contributor? No? Yes, if you could. Uh, I'll be quick. Okay. As so, brief as I am in my question. Uh, a question for our, our first contributor, really. So, if political constitutional is constitutionalism is on the rise, is, is your view it's being introduced in a way that is inconsistent with existing constitutional law? And if so, does it have to be introduced in that way, or is there a way of introducing it consistent with the, the forms of, of constitutional law? And for our second contributor, the discussion of the, uh, the analogy of the criminal law of self-defence looks uh, most interesting, but I wonder if it, if it holds, because uh, at least in um, the criminal law which I'm familiar um, criminal law makes provision for self-defence. It's not an unlawful action to exercise it. It might be vague as to whether one falls within or not, there are legal tests, but the criminal law sanctions self-defence. What you're outlining looks like it might be something, it might be an excessive use of self-defence or uh, some otherwise, some action that might otherwise be morally justified but the law doesn't make provision for. And there, by all means, you might want to uh, uh, justify post-fact, you know, have an act of indemnity or some other um, course of action. But I, want, I, I think the, there's a confusion going on there with the extension in the way you, you outlined. And so I wondered actually, um, uh, this is my speculation without knowing the, the Polish context as well as I should, but is, is the Parliament's action being conceived by the Parliament as self-defence, or is it rather an argument for constitutional supremacy, at least in relation to the question of the Constitution and, and structure of the, the Constitutional Tribunal? So I wonder, if, are you perhaps forcing on them an argument from self-defence in the criminal context, which they might disavow? Uh, Malcolm Craig from the University of New South Wales. Uh, my comment is addressed to Adam Chanato's Constitutional Manifesto, which, like its predecessor, had a lot more to say about sins of the present and past than in detail about the proposal for the future. It's, the title of the conference is uh, the Constitutional Crisis, and of course it is that, but it's much broader than that, both in the measures involved and being assessed, and its implications. It's a crisis of the rule of law. And Adam rightly, I think, says uh, that the rule of law was weakly institutionalised in most of Eastern Europe. It still is weakly institutionalised. He gives a lot of purported reasons for that, makes a lot of claims that they would have to be assessed, and some of them, I'm sure, are true. And he, he juxtaposes, as we just heard again, uh, legal with political constitutionalism. I can understand legal constitutionalism. I can understand political out of what he said. But I can't see any constitutionalism in it. I mean, if you say that uh, there are lots of defects in the existing legal system and we should oppose them by politics, well, that's what Lenin also said and did. And one would have to say, well, what is the sort of politics which distinguishes this from just politics? Apparently, it's parliamentary dialogue. The only model for dialogue that I've seen followed in the Polish case is the advice that a character in the American novel gave for bringing up children, shut up, I explain. This is, again and again, in the last several months, the introduction of private member, of changes in the judiciary by private members' bills so that they wouldn't have to be discussed. The various manoeuvres that uh, Professor Machak has mentioned, these are all clearly, one doesn't have to uh, speculate, these are designed to obviate the need for discussion by anyone except friends. That, in a larger context, and I think the larger context is terribly important here, this is, as Adam says rightly, not just a legal struggle, it's a political fight. And it's a Schmittian political fight where those who are make, right, making the running at the moment consider dialogue is only for those who are not the enemy, those who are within. The rest are outside the frame of discourse. And uh, it seems to be a pity, but it also seems to me hard to call it constitutionalism in any sense that I understand it. Or the rule of law. I think it's Barbara, I saw that. Mm -hmm. 
Barbara Holt by the University of Oxford. It's more of a side than a comment. Uh, I can check, uh, and I don't know if people have been following the current resignation or resignation, resignation or resignation. Or resignation or resignation. Um, and my question goes again to the legal or political constitution. And uh, I agree with your analysis, but I think the problem in many of these countries is that sort of you can you can almost rely on neither uh, to be uh, rely to be reliable or to be you know. Um, Pursuing, truly pursuing rule of law. Having observed the Czech situation, though, I would say that constitutional lawyers and the institution and the legal institutions have been doing a better job so far. But I do re realize that's very precarious, and once you get constitutional court stuffed with uh, political appointments, that very much changes. So, in a sense, I don't, you know, I don't have a, a, a proposal, and, and probably nobody does. But um, I just kind of feel that anything that we normatively propose is is a little bit based on what has been our experience domestically. And that th you know, things can kind of go wrong both with the political solutions or with the legal solutions. So I just, it's not, as I said, it's not even a question of whether it's a sign, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. That's our first part of three, and I already have people lined up, another three lined up for the next uh, round. So if you want to reply, please don't feel you have to reply to every comment made. Uh, just pick, pick the one you think are most useful for the comment you want to make. B, you first. Thank you. Thanks for the comments and questions. Um, well, let's start with the first one. Is uh, this that's the political constitution has to be in the opposition so to, the, to the legal version? No, not at all. I don't really understand it in such way. It seems to me it is a, rather the recovery of the of taking the legal constitutionalism and uh, and changing the type of discourse to make it common to both. It means to the citizens as well as to the lawyers. What I try to mention, maybe not, I didn't stress properly, is that, that the one of the characteristics of the legal constitutionalism is, is this hermetic language. It exists somewhere on, outside the normal public life. Therefore, it's transcendental. Let me make, use some examples on that. Okay, the 28 years, right, since the breakthrough, there was a plenty of, of, of uh, <clears throat> elections and uh, both sides of this political spectrum uh, won election. Left, center and right. What didn't change was the economical policies, despite of the, of the election promises, which shows that the public life, basically, was totally <coughs> separated, transcendental to the, to the life of the population. Similar process happened with the Constitution after 1997, it seems to me. Even before, right, with, the, with the amendments to the Constitution, that the legal constitutionalism was totally separated and the process was made more and more hermetic. It means taken out from the citizen. Therefore, I think it's not a clash between them. It's simply, I would put it maybe in such way, in connection to the last comment, that let's make a hypothesis. Okay, in 1989, so the sociological hypothesis, right? 1989, that all those <coughs> nations in the central Eastern post colonies Europe, they were, they were not mature enough. What, what the manifestation of that was a copying system. It was all those elite, basically. They passed and copied something from the West, and it's supposed to work, which was totally naive. Now what we observe, one generation later, remember, sociologically 25 years, is a more mature population. Population which not, don't want to be on the subject, move here and there, but precisely take these affairs in their own hands. Part of this process is a change of the discourse about the Constitution. And please, please don't make a mistake. I am not only referring to the political struggle, as Martin mentioned here, and the <clears throat> in the Parliament, because it's true, there's no dialogue in the Parliament at the moment. But if we look, if we follow the public discourse, not in the media only connected with the political sides, but somewhere in the middle, right? There is an attempt, conscious attempt, to merge, to take, to deharmonize language, legal language of the constitutionalism, social discourse, and also depoliticize language on the other side. So that's, it seems to me, potentially hope. And that's how, how I understand it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor Dickens, Dickens for, for, for this question. Now, I try to somehow explain the Polish constitutional crisis within boundaries of the symposium. It, is, it, it should not be interpreted in the way that the self-defense is the best tool to do so, for sure. 
I think perhaps a better better solution would be to use a state of necessity, which is different in the criminal criminal area as well. Uh, and of course, you can try to analyze the situation in terms of the parliamentary supremacy. However, I need to make one comment here. The Polish constitutional system is completely different from, from, from the British one. Yeah? And we don't have any principle of the parliamentary supremacy in our constitution. We have a balance, a separation of power, balance and cooperation of powers. And we sometimes say that the last time we had the supremacy of the parliament was in the communist constitution from 1952. And the problem with our crisis is that the current majority in the government, I think that's my opinion, does not recognize the Polish constitution as valid. They refuse to give legitimacy to this constitution. And you can see it, for example, in the... Uh, recently we had the 20th anniversary of this constitution and the Jarosław Kaczyński MP uh, said that it is a post-communist constitution. And there are, there are, there are, there are still... I think attempts to show that in fact uh, this constitution has no legitimacy, it should be changed, even if the current majority has no constitutional majority. So the Polish constitutional crisis, I believe, is best explained in terms of Bruce Ackermann's two types of politics. Uh, as, as remember, Ackermann said that there are two types of politics. There is a constitutional politics, a long-term politics in which we try to put into practice some values that we agreed that are the most important one and we put them into the constitution. And there is the regular politics that the parliaments uh, are carrying out and the regular politics must be performed in line with the constitutional politi politics. The problem is that the current government in Poland doesn't want to do so. They want, in fact, to change the constitution by ways of, of, of issuing uh, statutes by, by regular statutes and therefore the purpose from the very beginning was to paralyze the constitutional tribunal in order to make uh, the constitution not operating in fact because if you if you don't have an independent constitutional court you can change the constitutional order via regular statutes because there is no one to say that it is not admissible that you cannot do, do so so I believe that you know, we, we should all remember that our constitution is an old-fashioned constitution, continental constitution. It is the highest law, and all the lower acts, legal acts, must be compliant with, with it. The problem is that the current government wants to start a new, I mean, they, they want to start a fourth republic, because they don't accept the third republic based on the previous constitution. Therefore, uh, I think, per perhaps, as I said, Bruce Ackerman's idea of the constitutional politics and, and the regular politics is the best tool to explain what is happening in Poland at the moment. Thank you. I think we have time for three more uh, questions. Yes. Um, I'd like to make two uh, brief comments, if I may, to, to each of the first uh, two uh, presentations, first of which I shall thank you very uh, as, as far as Professor Czarnota is concerned, uh, I think I can, I, I can be a, a, a witness, a very good witness, to the lack of constitutional tradition in Poland after the collapse of communism. Between 19, uh, uh, for the first, uh, 1990 and 93, I was one of two foreign advisors to Professor Geremek's uh, constitutional, constitutional Committee. Uh, Geremek, uh, the second mouse, was Professor Andrzej Rapaczyński from Polanka. So we were supposed to represent the British or the European tradition and the, and the American tradition on, on this uh, tribunal. And the reason this happened was that in that body that was supposed to be drawn the constitution, there was not a single person who, there were a few people who spoke English, there were virtually nobody who actually had been abroad, and there was nobody who studied uh, political science or, or constitutional law in the West. There were people who were absolutely ignorant and ignorant, and I think this, this is an example of how shallowness the, the constitutional tradition, so to speak, was. Then what happened was that the, 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 the work of the, uh, the, the 
that the Constitutional Commission was subdivided into three subjects, and I was in a section to do with the with uh, the, the uh, state powers, that is the executive power, the president, the prime minister, and the, and the, the, the council of ministers. And uh, again, virtually we were the only two people, that is the uh, uh, Rapacinski and myself, who actually had any knowledge of it. There was tremendous pressure from Geremek, among other things, outside, to steer the Constitution into a sort of strong presidential uh, model. Uh, but uh, interestingly, Rapacinski agreed with me that, that, that there was absolutely no, no tradition in Poland that it was anything extremely dangerous like they are, and this was rejected. So far as the, uh, the, 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 the subsection that dealt with constitutional issues was chaired by Professor Zuchotska, who was then from uh, Adam Miskevich University. And, uh, but, and I can't, I, know, I don't know exactly what the details of the procedure was, but I know that, the, first of all, she very much dominated it. Secondly, the, the work of it, of the committee, was was restricted to drawing out a list of fundamental human and civic rights. That's all. There was very little about constitutions as such. So that, I, I hope, throws a little bit of light and supports the, 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 the thesis of the uh, speaker. So far as the second speaker is concerned, I think you just touched on it, but I would like to emphasize it even more. The first idea that the that the, that the, that the, that the the first idea that the decisions of the constitutional tribunal are not in some sense valid uh, and as they should not be listened to was expressed by Premier Kaczynski when he was premier in the mixed government. I forget the exact years. And there was a clash, I remember, which I read about in the press. There were some ministerial regulations which were passed by the government and which were rejected by the Constitutional Tribunal as being unconstitutional. I'm, I'm hesitant to cut you off, it's very rude, but we've, we've got so a few minutes. Just a few, two, two, two minutes. And then this creates an absolute fury of Jaroslav Kaczynski, who made a extremely strong speech in which he said that these people have absolutely no right to question the will of parliament and the government responsible to parliament, which had just been elected by a substantial majority and therefore represented the will of the people. And who were these people? He said, well, most of them are judges who have actually formed their formation goes back to the communist, communist, uh, communist period. And, and, and so he questioned went very loudly for the first time that I can remember the legitimacy of the Constitution Tribunal and the sense we what, what might, one might say that, that, that I'm, one I'm very grateful for then and is a continuation of the thesis which he first announced. Thank you. Uh, I'm very grateful for your comments and, yeah. and it's, it's fascinating to hear about that story about the foundation. I'm going to have to cut you off because I, can, I, can, I think I can even hear the coffee coming. And if I let things overrun, I think there might be revolution in this room. And I, I would be the one being revolted against. So I'll get the, the final two questions in before we go to court. Thank you. I can just check Oxford University Exeter College. Uh, I would like first to address the remarks of the Professor Charnota, who mentioned that one of the major weaknesses of Polish constitutionalism might be the lack of legitimacy among citizens, and that that could be because of the uh, lack of a dialogue uh, from the constitutional court. And uh, this I see as a sort of um, criticism towards the way the judgments at that level, at the constitutional court level, are drafted. So I would like just to uh, make some comment, and maybe the question that I, I might have here is that when I see the judgments of the constitutional courts worldwide, in England, in the US, I don't see much difference in the way as these courts are trying to make 
ordinary citizens to really understand uh, the key legal points. And I think it's very difficult and that constitutional court level where very detailed, technical, legally complex issues are decided to be um, um, to be in favor of, of, of making citizens involved in understanding. So I find here a big problem, the question which, whether we can resolve that, how do you think about that, uh, what, what solutions we might have to really get the citizens involved in inherently difficult exercise. That will be the first question to Professor Charnota and then to Professor Matcha. Uh, I really like the perspective of showing uh, self-defense on the part of the Constitutional Court, uh, but my main concern here would be that um, self-defense implies that there is unlawful action from the Constitutional Court, uh, because uh, we need to excuse the actions of the Constitutional Court um, that might be un unlawful otherwise. Therefore, as you noted that when there was one of the judgments where constitution was actually applied because the, the constitutional court was authorized under the constitution to make decision in vain, so it was no unlawful action. My question would be, did you see any unlawful actions on the constitutional court you would like to justify with the use of self-defense? That would be all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fine, fine, fine. Well, uh, <coughs> Just a few observations. Tomasz Wardyński, I'm a lawyer, nothing <coughs> to do with academia. I'm practicing in Poland for the last 40 years. And I can <coughs> maybe dare to say that what we are faced with is not really a constitutional crisis. We are faced with the crisis of the civic society because the institutions which are there to run the civic society became dysfunctional. Political parties are <coughs> composed of people of bad faith. They betrayed their mission, and media, in fact, betrayed its mission as well and does not protect the civic society in the sense that it does not educate and informs but builds up a capital of anger <coughs> with a view to help politicians to manipulate the society. Now, the self-defense was, <coughs> in a way, <coughs> articulated by the Constitutional Tribunal for as long as they could. Now, they are composed of, <coughs> so to say, people of bad faith again. So, they are uh, in a way orchestrating together with the other institutions which are composed of people of bad faith because when you prepare an attack on civic society institutions as it was mentioned by Professor Matchak, it means that you act in a bad faith, that your intent is underlined with bad faith. Now, <clears throat> the question is how to protect ourselves. I'm afraid that uh, it will have to do with a lot of education. And first of all, uh, <coughs> we have to cope with what is called constitutional illiteracy. And it is not, I would say, a Polish problem. I think that the problem exists everywhere in Europe. And it has to do <coughs> with the same problem which in Poland today is manifestly visible. It is not yet manifestly visible in other European countries, but will become slowly manifestly visible because, as I said, political parties, they are not fulfilling their role as they should. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time uh, um, now, but there'll be plenty more opportunities to ask questions. And at the end of the, um, in the final session, there'll be a long period for discussion as well. Um, and perhaps I might ask the speakers to give us five minutes each to um, wrap the session up before we break for coffee. Happy first. <coughs> thank you very much for the comments and the comments mainly. Thank you. And thanks Grzyszku, for the information I and mean, including the paper. I just want to make an announcement. <laughs> what I presented here is a part of the bigger project, which is a, sort of the connected with your comment in the end. It is a bigger project about the new constitutionalists in Central Eastern Europe. And uh, <coughs> let's start maybe with the question, with this sort of the Construct illiteracy and the problem of the 
of the betraying of the mission by the media and the lack of civic society or civil society. Well, generally, if we look, look at, across the Europe, you could identify plenty of the anti-systemic movement. Podemos, Syriza, it will happen earlier precisely for the same reasons. It means the reason, what reason? Not a lack of the, not a lack of social illiteracy, but disappointment with the operation of the system, which is based on the repetition of the same elite, political <laughs> elites, and of course the repetition of the same messages sent by the media. Now, the question, research question for us, for my colleagues from Wrocław, <coughs> Michał Stambulski and Michał Paziora, was the question, is the same what is happening in Eastern Europe, uh, starting from Slovenia, Romania, uh, Hungary, and Poland, is it one the same wave of changes as in the Western Europe, or is something specific? It seems to me that what is happening in Central Eastern Europe has a specific roots, which means it's not the same. It means we can't put to the same denominator as the anti-systemic movements in the in the West. So that's uh, that's my answer, say, to, to the to the comments. Probably, well, some scholars. I I value very much the Slovenian scholar uh, Bugaric, who tried to put this concept of the of the cultural uh, populism in the as a, in the constitutional context in, in central central eastern europe now the s question about the persuasiveness of judgments well technically it's a one part but communication it means who is the addressee of this, of this judgment there are studies and i value very much <coughs> the advice coming from the person who I, the former judge of the court uh, professor Wentoska. For years, she was in the Polish former judge of the Constitutional Court. For years, she, was, she argued delicately to the, to the judges, communicate with citizens. So it's not a question of the involvement of citizens in drafting the justification to the ruling. It's the opposite, that the <coughs> judges are also citizens. The judgment is not for, not for the lawyers only, it's also for the population in, in the particular country. Therefore, some persuasiveness should be present there. There are studies done and, uh, in, in Poland, the comparison of the, of the judgments if, <coughs> made by the uh, US Supreme Court and the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. And it shows precisely in this study that, that the communication does not exist. It's an escape to the totally formal type of, of language. So it seems to me that there is a possibility still, right, to simply engage, means treat citizens seriously. Because that's the, it seems to me, problem of the, of the, of the mature constitutional constitutional system, right? And, uh, well, that's probably, probably oh, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, Oops. I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, we've, we've, we've had the question session. Now, now I'm just okay. wrapping up the coffee. You're speaking in the next session, I believe? Um, well, uh, a short comment, yes. My position as a judge of a tribunal. I, I think I'd better not allow other people to leave you other comments, otherwise we won't get coffee. And that coffee okay, good. <laughs> really good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, answering your question, uh, uh, perhaps I, I, I did not make myself fully clear, but I, I, I want to come back to this distinction between three types of actions you can undertake, which is contra legam, obviously unlawful, Secundum legal, legum, obviously lawful, and preta legum, just in between, where you don't have a clear base for that. I believe that you can analyze the decision by the Constitutional Tribunal in March 2016 as a secundum legum action based on the Constitution, and the worst case scenario is preta legum, when you, which is not clearly stated, but it is in the spirit of the Constitution. I would like to bring your attention to the fact that in the report of the Venice Committee, the Venice Committee says that even if, we, if the Polish Constitution would not include this kind of regulation, that the judges are subject only to the Constitution, not to the statute, they would be allowed to, to, to do so, because that's, that's, that's the function of the constitutional, constitutional review. And let me make some general comment also somehow triggered by, 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 by uh, Mr. Wardyński's uh, comment. You know, I think we are discussing here uh, how the judges in Poland behaved, did they communicate with the society, uh, if the society, if we have a crisis of anger and so on and so on. You know, in fact, what we have in Poland now is a constitutional coup d'etat. 
<laughs> and it's, it's obviously clear that the current government cannot accept the constitutional limitation and they want to change it and they paralyze the Constitutional Tribunal that doesn't work at the moment. Uh, so, you know, I think there are more serious topics to discuss than the communication between the judges and the society at, the, at, at this moment. There is no respect for institution in the Poland at the moment. No respect. Just think, the Polish president two days ago announced that there should be a new referendum concerning the constitution, there should be a new constitution. My question is, who will respect this constitution? If the president did not respect the constitutional tribunal verdicts, who will respect the constitution enacted by the Polish parliament who did not, which did not respect the previous constitution. So the problem we have at the moment in Poland is deep constitutional and institutional crisis. And I think that the, 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 the topics and the issues concerning the communication are, are at, at, at the best secondary to that. Uh, uh, I think that what is at the moment important for us in Poland is to think how to uh, how to uh, start anew after what happened. And that's something that I would like to encourage you to discuss, especially in the uh, question and answer questions uh, session in the, in, the, in the second part of our meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank both of our speakers for getting the workshop, the conference off to such um, a racing start. And um, we've now got um, a break for coffee for um, about 20 minutes because we overran. We'll reassemble at um, 11.40 and um, well, thank you very much for your comments.